Hi, I'm John Atak. I'm Sam Atak. And we are here to talk about one of my favourite books. And um, Spike will probably... <laughs> no, I'm sorry, Spike. It's just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is... Uh, there you are, closer and closer. Intelligent Disobedience. Um, doing right when what you're told to do is wrong. Now, I'm going to declare an interest in this straight away that um, the man who wrote it is one of my closest friends and I've known him for ooh, 42 years now oh. so that tells you how old he is 42 42 and we're going to start with um, an extract um, what does he say if we distill intelligent disobedience down to a formula it would look something like this. Here are the four points, yep. read by my glamorous assistant. I don't like that. Understand the mission of the organisation or group, the goals of the activity of which you are a part, and the values that guide how to achieve those goals. Okay. okay. Understand the mission of the organisation or group, the goals of the activity of which you are a part, and the values that guide how to achieve those goals. So Point if you're in the military, it's shooting people. No, in, your, in the military it's protecting people oh. from being shot. Mm. There are different views of this. Yes. Um, but um, you're there to defend. Mm. And so the Ministry of... Oh, we're going to get into... We're going to get into truth. Orwellian yeah. Yeah, mini-truth. Mini uh, and the after the Second World War, exactly in time with the publication of 1984, which was in 1948... Mm. Just reverse the eight and the four. That's how he got the title. Um, he talks about this, and the Ministry of War became the Ministry of Defence. Mm. Okay, but that's what it should be. And yeah, and, I, and, and it, you know, I'm not going to diss the military because I didn't if, say which military, did it, I? No, you just said them all, really. But yeah, so I just put all the military. <laughs> but I, I feel we probably wouldn't be as safe if we didn't have any military. Yeah, that's true. Given the size <laughs> right. of North Korea's army at the moment. Yeah, if they didn't. Have them. Mm. Two. Two. When you receive an order that does not seem appropriate to the mission, goals and values, clarify the order as needed, then pause to further examine the problem with it, whether that involves its safety, effectiveness, cultural sensitivity, legality, morality or common decency. Mm. So yes, when you receive an order that does not seem appropriate to the mission, goals and values, clarify the order as needed, then pause to further examine the problem with it, whether that involves its safety, its effectiveness, its cultural sensitivity, its legality, its morality or common decency. Now, in authoritarian states, you don't ask questions, you do as you're told. Mm. That's the difference between an authoritarian and a non-authoritarian state. Make a conscious choice whether to comply with the order or to resist it and offer an acceptable alternative when there is one. Yeah. So three, make a conscious choice whether to comply with the order or to resist it and offer an acceptable alternative when there is one. Um, that seems pretty mm. cut and dried, doesn't it? Why don't you just read the last No, no. Do, okay. Read me that. It just <laughs> just seems to me that if, if we say it twice, then... You'll, It'll get through, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's difficult to take something in the first time. Mm. And you also can compare the difference in our reading voices and write comments saying, why didn't Sam do all the reading? Yeah, exactly. So much better Just at it. Rude. Okay, I'll read it twice this time. Just to... <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, why don't you read it backwards? Yeah, all right. Order the issued who of regardless accountable still are you. Order the obey you if that recognising choice you're for accountability personal soon. There you go. And I think that was perfectly unclear. Okay. Assume personal accountability for your choice, recognising that if you obey the order... You are still accountable, regardless of who issued the order. Assume personal accountability for your choice, recognising that if you obey the order, you are still accountable, regardless of who issued the order. Now, that is a principle that was arrived at, at the Nuremberg trials after World War II, where I think it was 1,800 people were tried, a huge amount of people tried for, for the horrific war crimes that had been committed. And frequently, um, people say, oh, "Befell is befell." Yeah, orders, orders are orders. orders. I was just following orders, and so it was determined 
that no matter what the law says, if you violate human decency, mm. you're responsible. Um, oh, I can't remember who talks about it, but the agentic state that because you th you don't feel you have responsibility because it's an order, Milgram. you can do atrocious things. Yeah, I think it is Milgram. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Milgram showed the, 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 you know, when he did his experiments in Yale in the early 60s, um, he first of all canvassed psychiatrists to say how many people will actually comply mm -hmm. and be willing to give a shock to somebody. And it averaged out to 1%. And um, it actually turned out that um, I think it was 62.5% in the first experiment were willing to go to the maximum, yep. which has got a triple X dangerous <laughs> thing on it, just because somebody in a white coat was saying, it's my responsibility. And 100% shocked. Yeah, nobody refused to give a shock. Mm. And um, that's pretty incredible. Mm. That is that is really incredible. And we can get into the ethics of the experiment. And yes, by our standards, it was not an ethical experiment. But um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't use uh, what can be learned from it. And Milgram was painstaking. He... Um, Maybe that's the wrong, wrong word to use. <laughs> um, I think there are 17 variants that he did on the experiment uh -huh. and it was followed up by many people. Mm. And when people said, oh, well, they guessed that it was an actor screaming. I mean, the last yeah. one, the, the guy was in the room with them screaming and there was you know, no white coat and they weren't at Yale anymore. Yeah. He just okay. kept that's making good. it more remote. Somebody replicated it using a live puppy mm. and it was given shocks. So, uh, yeah, you know, the compliance is there. Now, Ira hit upon this thing. He, Ira pioneered courageous followership, the idea that followers are responsible for their leaders, which is, again, mm. it's an authoritarian situation where you think you just do what the leader tells you to do. And he's been working on this for a long time and he's celebrated quite rightly around the world um, for the work he's done on courageous followership. And he was giving a talk one day and somebody said that they could exemplify what he was, was talking about mm. with what they had under the desk, uh, something like that. And out came a guide dog that they were, they were training. Now, mm. in researching his uh, book, he came across this uh, statement from um, the President Donald Kennedy of uh, Stanford in his 1985 commencement speech. He said, we are reminded of one fascinating aspect of guide dog training called intelligent disobedience. The dogs must learn to resist the master's authority, but only when they see something is wrong, a speeding car, a hole in the path. So it must be with education in a democratic society. Students must learn, as an essential part of their education, how and when to resist and challenge aspects of that very education. The idea of selective, intelligent disobedience to educational authority should, we think, be favoured as an educational aim. Mm. And um, we agree with uh, President Donald Kennedy, Stanford University, completely. Um, it's surprising, and you know, we did a piece recently about the education system and made some criticisms of... Uh, of this very problem uh, where the educators are being trained. We, we use the, um, a, a British manual that, that is endorsed by the National Union of Teachers and has yeah. the deathly stare in it, um, which are ways of, of getting compliance, mm. not only out of, of the kids, but out of the parents. You know, that little section that says treat them the same way. What was the statement, I am the teacher and you must obey? I am the like teacher that. and you must obey. Um, mm. Ira says that he read a report written for the US Senate Health, Education, Labour and Pensions Committee titled The Dangerous Use of Seclusion and Restraint Remains Widespread and Difficult to Remedy. Isn't that a great That's title? That's so catchy. <sighs> a movie called we that We should have sell. titles yeah. like that. Dangerous Use of Seclusion and Restraint Remains Widespread and Difficult to Remedy. Mm. Starring Johnny Depp, uh, um, cool. Bruce Willis. Um, for, Clint Eastwood, sorry. I don't think Clint's doing any acting anymore. Oh, why? Well, he's 100 years old now. Oh, okay. He's directed some pretty good films. Million Dollar Baby was his. Yeah. For which uh, Paul Haggis got a, an Oscar for the screenplay. Hmm. Yeah. 
probably quite right, rightly it is a clever film but Unforgiven is a brilliant film which yeah. he does actually act in uh, apart from the, the beating mm. you know, in the middle of it that's a bit where Gene Hackman beats up uh, is it Richard Harris or somebody else um, this was published on the 12th of February 2014 in case you think it's an ancient document the report starts with a provocative sentence this past August, an Arizona teacher used duct tape to restrain a second grader to a chair because she was getting up to sharpen her pencil too frequently. Jesus. Okay. So, <clears throat> here's a clue. Don't sharpen your pencil too often. <laughs> um, as Iris says, unfortunately, there is virtually no intelligent disobedience training in human school systems. Hmm. Now, Oscar Wilde, and we've used this quotation before. So Disobedience in, is man's original virtue. There you go. Disobedience is man's original virtue. And I think that is true. It's just a matter of, you know, when you look at, again, uh, I'm going to keep going on about this, the Chinese and Russian systems, uh, so-called communist systems, they say basically uh, the people at the top understand things, you don't. Uh, so just do as you're told. Yeah. And I'm totally against that. I think everybody, everybody's opinion is, is valuable. I, I believe in the concept of open-mindedness, um, mm. that we should be willing to hear other people's concerns and consider them. I mean, a good example is the Cuban Missile Crisis of when it's very important for somebody to, well, intelligently disobey. Orders. Which is, is what happened, that, that there were, were there three or four Russian submarines actually within the coastal waters of Cuba. Yeah. And uh, it only came out around about 2000 that they were armed with nuclear warheads. Mm. And there was a situation they'd been told by the Kremlin that they could act on their own responsibility. Mm. So they could choose to launch <laughs> nuclear uh, torpedoes, I think they were in fact rather than missiles. They could... Mm. They could yeah release these things and there were american ships cruisers or you know mm. big, big ships in the region and it just so happened that the decision came down to the american commanders and the russian commanders it never got back to the top military uh -huh. and very sensibly the american commander said look if you leave we'll forget that you were here yeah and then in the i think it was around about 1983 there was a, a russian colonel at one of the um, radar stations, mm. and they had there were electrical disturbances in the clouds that made their equipment say there was a missile strike yeah, happening. Coming. And it was at a point where, out of sheer genius, the uh, NATO was doing manoeuvres on the Russian border, on the well, the Warsaw Pact country's borders in Germany, mm. and so it it really did seem that this might be it. Yeah. And this guy decided not to report it, not to retaliate. And he was actually busted for that, for failing to follow procedure. <laughs> and um, World War Three was averted by three, six seconds or something yeah. because he did it. After that, he, he received medals and awards <laughs> from true. people who were a bit more sensible yeah. in the Russian military. Again, Iris says here, I, I'm focusing on how training a million and a half teachers in classroom management may have the unanticipated meta effect of creating a climate of obedience that potentiates authority running amok. And I think we are seeing this. Yeah. We're seeing tremendous compliance. Um, I, you know, let's talk about the Don. Mm. Uh, that when my friend Steve Hassan, his book, uh, great book actually, really really good book mm. uh, called The Cult of Trump. Um, it, there, a review was published, quite a lengthy article in the Daily Mail, which uh, I, I pointed out to Steve actually is the largest circulation newspaper in the world mm. because it's online circulation. Because he was ha he's having difficulty getting the US media to get involved because mm. the, the Democrats are going, oh, no, we don't want to say anything like that because we might lose votes. Uh, and yeah. the Republicans, uh, they're against it. Of course, uh, in, in the words of, of Groucho, whatever it is, I'm against it. As long as the Don is. As long as the Don is. But reading that there, there were already, it was a, you know, only a day or so after it was published, there were already 233 comments on the website <laughs> of the Daily Mail. And a lot of them were like, stupid, stupid, stupid. And 
that worries me that somebody who's not read the book and I have recently um, written a response to an academic called Benjamin Zeller who didn't read the book but mm. saw the promotion and decided he didn't like the word cult and didn't like the word brainwashing, which Steve Wasn't doesn't really use in the book. And he wanted to talk about charisma, which is not a concept that Steve discusses mm. in the book, which is fine. But I've written a lengthy response to that, which, which I hope he'll engage with and, and um, we can talk about it because um, the problem is with authoritarianism, you take a view, you say, well, my leader is, is the best person in the mm. world. I, I don't really understand the economic policy or the military policy, and nor mm. does Donald Trump, for that matter, it would seem, because from one day to the next, he changes his mind about things. Though, he, you know, he has put some focus on China, mm. and bless him for that, because it's been too long in coming, since the 1980s. I have been suggesting that we should not link our economy with that of China, mm. because it is a totalitarian, authoritarian, totalist, fascist, tyrannical state, mm. um, which violates human rights massively and horribly um, so by training teachers in um, bringing about obedience rather than bringing about discussion you know rather than the um, you know, we talked about uh, Matthew Lippmann's approach mm. to education which is much more you know rather than we pour facts into your head and then you regurgitate them in an exam yeah it's um, more a collaboration towards understanding hmm where we're all participants, mm. teachers and pupils, in, in furthering our understanding, because our understanding of the universe is not yet complete. And we have a lot of subjects which are, I think, rather questionable. That um, Sociology, for example, I think can have good uses, but mm. you've been studying it recently. And you, What was it you said the other day about psychology and sociology, that psychology is... Uh, uh, at least how it's presented in... Uh, my school book at the moment for psychology you have to learn a name and then an experiment for sociology you have to learn a name and then an opinion yeah and they they do they you know sometimes their pronouncements uh, brian wilson not the beach boy but the um the professor of sociology the late brian wilson he spelled his name with a y instead of an i not to differentiate between good vibrations and <laughs> bad vibrations actually, <laughs> he said that um, you can't trust anybody that's left a new religious movement or authoritarian mm -hmm. group um, because they're apostates. They've renounced the teaching and so they're not trustworthy. Um, Gordon Melton has repeated this, this notion. Well, I, as somebody who's interviewed hundreds of former members of such groups and been able to check their stories, one against another and against the documents, yeah. I found them to be surprisingly accurate Whereas people who are representing the group, I found them, they frequently that lie. so crazy. So like a Nazi who renounces that and wants to talk about his experience or the camps, we can't trust what he has to Well, it say. happened. It happened with Rauschening, Hermann Rauschening. He mm -hmm. um, was the first Nazi leader to be elected to power. We talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, he was the president of the uh, Senate of the Free City of Danzig or I think it's Gdansk now, mm. Ablasha. Um, there was a thing called the Polish Corridor that was established after World War I so that Poland would have a route to the Baltic Sea mm. on that side. And so Prussia was to the north of this, part of Germany mm. was to the north of it, and the rest was below it. And um, it was decided that it would be a free city Mm. So it would govern itself. And he was elected, I think, in the late 1920s to be president. And he was a Nazi. Mm. And so therefore, you know, Hitler is not in power yet. Yeah. So he's Hitler's favoured guest and, and spends many weekends mm. uh, vacationing with Hitler. And he kept a notebook. Mm. And uh, every evening after talking with Hitler, he'd write down what Hitler had said. And in about 1938, he worked out uh, that Hitler was going to kill the Jews. Mm. And while he was himself anti-Semitic, you couldn't really be a Nazi without being anti-Semitic, yeah. um, he didn't think that mm. that was the final solution. Um, so people argue about whether Hitler wanted to do this. Well, this guy in 1938 wrote a book called Hitler Speaks, mm. uh, which records the table talk of Adolf Hitler. And it's a remarkable book, and it's ignored by historians. Ah. 
Um, yet, from from my reading of it, everything he says in there can be shown to be true. Mm. You know, so uh, I was commenting earlier, and it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about, but that's the way it is with these rambling conversations that we have. That um, you would you would base um, your you'd have a kind of system of initiation and hierarchy mm. that, that derived from the Freemasons yeah. and their 33 or 34 levels of initiation. Some people say the 34th one's where you worship Baal instead of mm. Yahweh, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, maybe they do, maybe they don't. It's all pretty weird, I think. You know, the sword and the gag and the all this mm. blindfold and, the, you know, mm. cut your tongue out. And it's not my kind of no. club, really. I, I prefer things where people kind of play music and chat. Yeah. And, um, and don't I'm little, sure Freemasons do that, too. Yeah, but they wear little lambskin aprons. and Ah, uh, yeah, I've gone off them. It's very odd. But anyway, Hitler said that you would have to base... You know, it's kind of hierarchy upon the Freemasons, and your organization would be based upon the Jesuits. Now, this particularly struck me because I, I read the book in 1996 mm. when I was in Cape Town, in fact, uh, which was fantastic, mm. wonderful place, um, beautiful place. And um, it's about three years earlier, I've been talking with a friend who's he goes publicly by the name of George Shaw um, because Scientology can be a bit vindictive so he wasn't tremendously keen on Israel identity mm. being known um, But it, so three years before this he's had a conversation with me where he said oh he thought that Hubbard had based the initiations the levels of Scientology on the Freemasons and the organisation on the Jesuits so <laughs> my jaw dropped when I read <laughs> Rauschening in 1938 saying that Hitler had said this but of course, mm. it's very possible that Hubbard read this yeah. book you know, <laughs> and figured it out. This mm. would be a good way to go. But we, that's a slight uh, deviation from this. Yeah, refusal skills. Um, children who are taught refusal skills are more likely to make positive choices and refrain from engaging in high-risk behaviours. Mm. Helping children set limits for themselves and say no outside pressures increases their self-confidence when children learn to stop and consider the consequences before responding to a request as well as a variety of ways to say no they become more accomplished at refusing to participate in anything that could harm themselves or others mm. so refusal skills yeah that seems like something you want but and you 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 had a particular example of this um at school, which I think we mentioned before yeah, last, we last December, um, when yeah. um, the, the tutor at school became upset with, with Sam mm. and um, afterwards very graciously apologised, um, but said that he'd never had a student basically answer him back before. Yeah. And so I gave him a copy of this book. <laughs> and uh, when I last saw him, he said he'd read a chapter of it. Um, and I was like, oh, no, you need to read the whole book. <laughs> um, mm. That this is a fundamental, we are creating a society um, by, by not helping people to question authority. And mm. you know, it's always been, been my way with all four of my children that, that I want them mm. to feel comfortable questioning my authority and uh, correcting me if I'm wrong. Not that I ever have been, of course. You know, <laughs> it has That's happened. Wrong. Has happened once or twice, as Paul Simon <laughs> says in a song. I was wrong once. <laughs> Could be wrong again. Uh, yeah. A friend who I turned out to be an enemy. Yeah. Ari talks about. He says there is a mesmerizing flow that occurs when one begins to obey authority that can take on a life of its own. Um. And it's true that, that compliance, I, I remember um, I uh, asked a, a psychologist, a forensic psychologist, police psychologist called Brian Tully mm -hmm. to give a talk about 25, 30 years ago um, at a meeting. 
And he, he largely dealt with white collar crime, mm. embezzlement, things like that. And he said it, it was almost always the same thing, that he'd be sitting interviewing the guy and the guy would say, he was a lawyer, and he said, well, my boss came in and said, would you, oh, we should have, this contract should have gone out yesterday, would you backdate it? Mm. And you get this little step. Yeah. I call it increments yeah. of dissonance, that once you've got somebody to do and something like that. Darren Brown in the push, get somebody to push somebody off a building by the end of it. Several Just people. Through. Yeah, uh, three out of four. Yeah, uh, you spoiled it now. I'm sorry. Uh, but do, do uh, yeah. I think it was called Push to the Edge when it came out here, but I think it's up think on Netflix, Netflix yeah. as the push. And it's amazing because you know, he uses hypnotic means elsewhere. But here he's not. He, he's never personally involved. Yeah, just social pressure. And you, within four hours, you arrive um, as, a, as a, an assistant, a volunteer, for a charitable event and the idea is that they need a huge donation from this guy mm. and they start by saying oh look we've got these little sausage rolls here could you put this label on them that says they're vegetarian yeah <laughs> <laughs> and people do <laughs> and they take them through so those increments of dissonance getting it comply so it's very important to be aware when somebody's asking you to trick lie cheat mm. steal or do something for them because as often happens with gangs and gangsters, they'll do you a favour, they'll get you to do something, and then, of course, they'll tell on you <laughs> that you did it, and you're now tied in to, the, yeah. to their system, and it, it won't get easier or better. Um, and another little point, impoliteness, which is a skill that we should all master. Yeah. Sometimes we can effectively perform acts of intelligent disobedience politely but resolutely, assertively. We must also be able to act with determined impoliteness when necessary. And that's a hard barrier mm. for, for those of us who are brought up you yeah, know, to be plan. nice and courteous to everybody. But sometimes you have to be rude. It doesn't mean you have to shout at people and call them names. It means you have to assert yourself very firmly and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Mm. And occasionally you have to tell them why. I think we've got another one as well here. He, he's talking about learned helplessness. Um, um, learned helplessness was a concept um, first defined by Marty, Martin Seligman and mm. um, what he was doing was uh, giving electric shocks to dogs <laughs> that's messed up hey Martin and he, now people are, are saying that he's the great guru of happiness and which is nonsense because he got some real jollies from shocking those dogs well he, he wrote this awful book I, I'm sorry but he wrote this awful book where, where he talks about if you pretend to be happy for long enough, you'll become happy. And, and it came about because his daughter told him how miserable he was. Mm. And that, that's how behavioural therapy works, that you, you basically mm. groove in a new way of behaving. But the pretense of happiness is not happiness. And this is a man that shocked dogs for a living. Um, and one day they forgot to put the harnesses on the dogs that restrained them, and the dogs didn't move when they got the shocks. And so he accidentally discovered learned helplessness, that if you are traumatised enough, and um, we in the UK we have a, a law about coercive control, which has gone beyond the idea of domestic violence and said, well, actually domestic violence is, you know, that's towards the end of the pattern. Mm -hmm. the, the pattern is one of coercive control. And it's, oh, why didn't she leave him? You know, well... Mm -hmm. Because we acquire helplessness. And you also have Stockholm Syndrome where you, when somebody's threatened you with a gun enough times, you can say, oh, don't hurt them. Um, yeah, I but of learned helplessness, he says, in a highly regulated society, individuals and entire citizenry can sink into a state of learned helplessness. Now, yeah. and he says to cultivate an instinct for questioning rules that seem to defy common sense and developing the art of questioning effectively are core competences of creative intelligent disobedience. This really reminds me of the what was it called the one child that's exactly what I was going to say one child nation um uh, Lorna Goldberg alerted me to it it's funny because mm. I'd recorded it from the tv a week before and she mm. saw it way over there across the Atlantic and mm. said what a devastating documentary yeah. and it is Probably the most devastating documentary I've ever seen. It's certainly on a par with work on the concentration camps mm. in terms of its shock value, because it shows that um, 
what they claim, I think they claim 380 million um, babies were aborted or murdered. Mm -hmm. And there's a woman who says that she was involved in forced sterilizations, abortions, and the murder of babies in 50 to 60,000 cases during her professional career. And so she spent the last 20 years helping people with fertility. Yeah. And um, quite evidently from the... She, I watch the documentary. If you're squeamish, don't watch the documentary yeah. because you will see that they actually killed babies after they were born as part of their one-child policy. What is astonishing and what you were going to point mm. to, yeah. I think, is that everyone, Nan Fu Wang, who made the documentary, grew up in China, then six years ago moved to America, mm. and she had a baby, one-year-old baby, mm. took home to the family, and she talks with everybody and anybody about the one child policy which only stopped in 2015 you can now have two children and we think it may be that there's forced sterilization still after you've had a second mm. child uh, and you don't have any choice that they do it to you uh, which is something of a an enormous violation of, of human rights what was astonishing was that i apart from this wonderful woman who said you know Okay, it was state policy. They said I had to do it. But I was the executioner. I did it. Mm. And she'd taken responsibility. A Buddhist monk had told her that for every one child that she could bring into the world by helping infertile couples mm. would perhaps write off a hundred of, of the... And, you know, they're mm. often late terminations, their third trimester, the, the last period of pregnancy, mm. where forced... Abort abortions were happening so this is not you know a woman's right to choose in those first weeks this is you're actually and there's an artist who went around collecting what is considered to be medical waste mm -hmm. little fetuses put into bags and just thrown onto rubbish tips so that's what happens mm -hmm. when you get um unintelligent obedience that people who'd had it done to them are saying, yeah, but but without it, China could yeah, have Yeah, exactly. The attitudes of the people, even now that we're being interviewed. And uh, there's one scene with Nan Fu in there. She's asking them questions. And they're like, it's obvious we just don't talk about it. And it's obvious why we throw away the Female. females. Yeah. And keep Why them. would you want them? Yeah. You know, they, you're not part of the family anymore, she was told by her grandparent, because you're a woman. So you married a man mm. and you're part of his family now. So you want a boy so that um, you can continue your lineage. Now, it's worth putting in at this point that, that we pretty much know now that if people are properly fed and properly looked after mm. and have enough, then the birth rate goes down. Yeah. In fact, it's gone down so badly in some countries. Japan particularly has a birth rate of uh, 1.5. So mm. for every two adults, only one and a half children are born. Mm. Um, so or three children for every four adults, if yeah. you're going to be, you know, because... It's not actually half babies at any point. Yeah. And that's a serious problem um, because it means the population is diminishing. So the reality is if China had not murdered and starved its population, then they would have come into control. Mm. The same is true in India, where an awful sterilization program was run by Indira Gandhi. Mm. You did get a free transistor radio if you agreed to have a vasectomy. Um the point is that you create a society that cares for its people and then they'll mm. spend less time having babies yeah. and you you hand out condoms and mm. you know, I don't really care what the Pope thinks about that. Um, that that's a much, much better way of making sure that, that we'll have a sustainable planet mm -hmm. is to not have uh, as many children. Yeah. And you don't do that by traumatizing a whole generation all of these women who were dragged screaming to be sterilized um and probably still will be under mm. the two child program the only place where it hasn't happened pretty much is in the outer regions the, the conquered um countries like xinjiang where a million people are in camps uh, how to brainwash a million people was shown by bbc panorama this week a million people 10 percent of the population is in Jiang in the extreme uh, northwest of China which is a conquered nation they're Muslims, they're not 
Han Chinese, or Tibet, which they conquered immediately after. In 1950, they started going there. In Tibet, they, they basically they failed to enforce their policy. So the Han Chinese keep moving in. Nine million of them have moved into Xinjiang, which has a, had a population of 12 million before they arrived. Mm. But they are bound by this policy, so they can't keep reading. The Tibetans you know, may still have 14 children, and so the Chinese are just not going to win. In the end, you have to be decent if you want to create a decent world. You can't create a decent mm. world by being tyrannical and horrible. And a large part of that is intelligent disobedience. So... You know, be willing to disobey. Do it, if you can, politely. If you have to, impolitely. Mm. Um, and we absolutely recommend this book. Everybody in the world should read this book. It's been translated into Russian, been translated into Chinese, mm. which is a thought, and I hope they don't see this video and think that I've got anything to do with it. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's a vital book for the next generation mm. because if you traumatize a generation if you enforce obedience into a generation bad things will happen mm. whereas if you you know the commander of your american vessel and your commander of your russian vessel can be intelligently disobedient mm. and go their ways world war three doesn't start so mm. let that be a lesson to us all because yeah. we'd, we'd rather not do that i'm john Aitken. i'm Tommy. thank you for spending your time with us mm.